Echo Chamber is a neutral actor, merely a conduit for souls wishing to express themselves on whatever's left of the internet. We neither endorse nor denounce any idea expressed on our program save the idea that ideas should be expressed freely or without coercion. From Echo Chamber is a neutral actor, merely a conduit for souls wishing to express themselves on whatever's left of the internet. The opinions expressed are not necessarily the opinions of FSM, Roger Sanchez, or any other parties of Echo Chamber. If you are offended by free speech, please leave the broadcast, as if any of this will get rid of the inevitable censorship to come. We fucked up the intro, but that's okay because FSM has sponsored Echo Chamber at Trovo.live forward slash free speech media and Facebook.com forward slash free speech media network. It's that time of the week. I course am Roger Sanchez, and you are on the Echo Chamber Saturday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We've got a great show coming up for you guys. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back. So today on Echo Chamber, we have two guests. We have Archie Flower. He is the the chair of the Libertarian Party of Vermont. We also have D.L. Cummings uh, from Liberty Dad and the Libertarian Party of Duval County, Florida. And they're going to be talking about this question. The Libertarian Party is best served by members disassociating from bigots. Thank you all so much for watching. I've been looking forward to this debate, and I can't wait to have it. So remember, guys, on the Echo Chamber podcast, Super Chats are as free as speech should be. And if this is your first time to the broadcast, I'm very glad you're here. Uh, you can follow us on any of the links uh, next to my my disembodied head here. Trovo.live forward slash free speech media. Facebook.com forward slash free speech media network. T.me forward slash echo chamber podcast. Facebook.com forward slash echo chamber program find us on MeWe, and of course we're live now on dlive.tv forward slash echo chamber podcast but for those of you who are new let me talk to you about the way that this show works so echo chamber is a discussion program with set rules loosely following oxford style so one of our guests is going to be able to go and and uh, present their position for up to 10 minutes then the other guests will respond for up to 10 minutes then the guests or the participants can respond to each other for up to 10 minutes each. And then they each can ask each other up to three questions, a two-minute response time for the response. Uh, at that point, we take uh, questions from the audience, which is my favorite part of the program. And remember that on Echo Chamber, the Super Chats are as free as speech should be. So definitely get your questions in. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guests. Uh, a fellow New Englander live on the screen now from Vermont, we have Archie Flower. You may remember him from his debate on a very similar topic with, topic with the great Dave Smith, and he has entered the echo chamber. Uh, Archie, thank you so much for taking some time to speak with us. Thank you, Roger. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you, DL. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, all the way on the opposite end of New England in sunny, beautiful Florida, it's D.L. Cummings. He's from the show Liberty Dad, also on Free Speech Media. Uh, D.L., thanks for taking the time and suggesting this. So we, we appreciate that you wanted to communicate your thoughts on this topic, and thanks for taking some time with us. Absolutely, and uh, thank you for hosting, and thank you, Archie, for obliging your time. All right, guys. So uh, typically, I, I try to do whatever I can to be as unbiased as possible on this show. That's not possible. I can't be completely unbiased, uh, but I do what I can. So my understanding of this position is that I'm going to most likely disagree with Archie. Now, that I don't know. Maybe he'll change my mind. So because of that, I'm going to allow Archie to decide who gets to go first and who gets to go second. So Archie, I know we talked about this before the show. Archie, what have you decided? Are you going first or are you going second tonight? So Roger, I uh, I uh, picked a number on a die, uh, the top four through six, and I would go first if I got a four through six. But I rolled a one, so the pleasure of going first is all. Well, okay, so that nat one, it's always a killer. So Archie is going to go first. Uh, before we do go live, though, oh, go ahead. Hello, role player. Yeah, I, I picked up on that. It's that nat one. That nat one, that's a critical fail. Already off to a bad start. But hey, nat 20 could be coming on the way. Uh, both of our guests have done something very unique to Echo Chamber. I, I do pay a lot of our guests for coming on. I want to appreciate their time and their labor. Typically, I send the donations to them directly. Uh, but Archie and DL actually have talked about some charities uh, that they wanted to disclose. And uh, Archie... Uh, is giving his payment to the Fully Informed Jury Association, and DL 
is get, taking his funds and giving it to Daniel, uh, improving the odds for kids. So, uh, Archie, can you tell me a little bit about the Fully Informed Jury Association and why that was important to you? The Fully Informed Jury Association is an educational organization, and their whole point is to inform people that juries don't actually have to find someone guilty if they believe morally that the law itself was bad. So if, uh, you know, if it's really a case of self-defense, but the prosecutor's going for murder or something, the jury can just refuse to, um, they, can, they can hang the jury and they can refuse to find um, guilty per law. Very good. It's one of the most liberal organizations I could think of. And DL, can you tell us a little bit about Daniel's kids? Go ahead, DL. Uh, yes, yeah, so Daniel Kids is an organization here in Jacksonville, and they work with at-risk teens and youth, and they have several ways that they do that. They work closely with some caseworkers, and they also have some facilities where teens can be on-site, on-premise, and learn, and, uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, have a chance at having a bit of a better life because they come from a disadvantaged background, and so these are all volunteer organizations, and they even accept volunteer mentors, which I was one for about two, roughly two and a half years with a teenager who I'm still in contact now that he has become an adult. Wonderful. Hey, well, thank you guys so much. I, I, maybe an echo chamber tradition now to actually give these funds uh, to a charity of their choice. So guys, thank you so much for stepping up to the plate and doing that. So enough Beating around the bush, it's time to get into the echo chamber. Archie, it is 9.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you have 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes, to tell us why the Libertarian Party is best served by its members disassociating from bigots. Archie, the time is yours. Roger. Roger. I, I thought I said DL. Oh, you said DL? Well, then DL, the time is yours. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, so the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines bigot as a person who obstinately or intolerantly is devoted to his or her, her own opinions and prejudices. Oxford Dictionary defines it as a person who has very strong, unreasonable beliefs or opinions about race, religion, or politics, and who will not listen to or accept the opinions of anyone who disagrees. And the Cambridge Dictionary defines it as a person who has strong, unreasonable beliefs, and who does not like other people who have different beliefs or a different way of life. By any of these three definitions, I would argue that any libertarian could easily point to numerous other libertarians who fit these definitions, some who share similar views with the people pointing. Freedom of association is a fundamental idea to a free society, and it's an idea that libertarians hold dear. With the freedom to associate does come the freedom to disassociate, and I do not argue against either. My argument is that merely disassociating on the basis of obstinate belief does not best serve the party. The, that argument starts with a term that three formal references define rather broadly. But even if we, re we revise the test for obscenity from saying, I'll know it when I see it, to a test for bigotry and say, I know one, I'll know one when I meet one, observation and data do not support disassociation on that basis. Consider in the 2017 documentary, White Right Meeting the Enemy by Dia Khan, a Muslim activist of Middle Eastern descent, Dia is interviewing Ken Parker, a longtime member of the white power movement and once grand dragon of the KKK. Dia reads him some of the hate mail that she had received, which includes some very foul slurs. She tells Ken that such language, quote, hurts her. And when, Dia, uh, and, and when asked by Dia why he is nice to her, Ken points out, he said, this is what he says, you've been completely respectful to me. I actually consider you to be a friend. My opinion about Muslims since interacting with you has gone up significantly. He then mentions when his, that when his girlfriend was in the hospital for a month, the only one to call was a woman from the mosque. He then says this, quote, holy shit, I can't believe that here are these people that I fucking hate are checking up on her, end quote. 
The following year, Ken Parker reached out to a local pastor of an almost entire black church. Several weeks later, he was baptized as a member of that same church and seeking to have his racist tattoos removed. Consider the experience also of Daryl Davis, an R&B and blues musician who had struggled with why some people might hate him who didn't even know him. Mr. Davis set up a meeting with Roger Kelly, the imperial wizard of the KKK in Maryland at the time. The meeting was tense, but led to many more meetings and even a friendship. It ultimately led to Roger Kelly leaving the KKK along with others as Davis continued associating with other members. We might even consider my own experience in eighth grade. Egos had clashed between myself and a peer. We decided to settle it at a local park after school. I lost spectacularly. After repeated kicks to the side of my chest, the other student gave one final kick while reminding me of the insult that I used that got me there. Word quickly got to the teachers at the Catholic school we attended, and despite the fight not being on school grounds, they decided to take action. Our science teacher pulled us both together and indicated we had a project to work on together, and this project would be a significant part of our grade and could affect whether or not we passed that class and moved on to the ninth grade. Through that project, we actually became close friends, hanging out almost every day. We even started attending church together. Unless you knew the backstory, you would have never guessed that he once gave me a beating. But hey, maybe Daryl and Dia are anomalies. They're people with unique personalities that allow them to accomplish what most of us cannot. Maybe my experience was simply a fortunate outcome that we cannot come to expect. This brings us to the next question. What does the research say? American psychologist Gordon Allport articulated the contact hypothesis in his 1954 book, The Nature of Prejudice. This theory holds that prejudice and conflict within various groups is greatly reduced between minority and majority group members when members share four conditions, and those are equal status, common goals, cooperative work, and institutional support. Many studies since have confirmed this theory in various group settings. In a 2006 paper, social psychologists Linda Tropp and Thomas Pettigrew conducted a meta-analysis of 515 such studies, concluding the consistency of contact does reduce prejudice. That analysis also produced three interesting caveats. One, results did not reflect self-selection. That is, contact was beneficial regardless whether one sought out the other or not. Two, contact reduces prejudice with other minority groups. And then three, while the four conditions produced better results, prejudice was reduced even when some of the conditions were unmet. Later, psychologist John DeVito suggested that contact changes how we categorize others through a process called decategorization. This shifts our view from seeing others as, um, uh, to seeing others as an individual rather than a member of a group. And then another process called recategorization, which places that person in a larger group with whom we are not in conflict with. Stories like Dia Khan, Daryl Davis, and even my own illustrate these, categorization, uh, these categorization changes. Having said all that, one might ask, where does the Libertarian Party fit in all of this? After all, the Libertarian Party is a political organization with the purpose of influencing legislation and getting members elected to various local, state, and national government positions. It is not, as one person told me, rehab for terrible people. Furthermore, it's said by associating with bigots, we send a clear signal to the targets of their bigotry. The word individual, I just want to point this out, the word individual is used in our party platform 40 times. But beyond just word counts, the second sentence in our own platform says this, we believe that respect for individual rights the in the, is the essential precondition for a free and prosperous world that force and fraud must be banished from human relationships and that only through freedom can peace and prosperity be realized. 
During a podcast interview, our current LNC chair made the point that if you're a member of the Libertarian Party, then you have as much say as any other member in the direction the party goes. He further pointed out that this greatly distinguishes us from the Republican and Democratic parties. Over and over, our party demonstrates its dedication to the individual. The Libertarian Party is the best shot individuals have to see a world set free in our lifetime. Our attention and dedication to the individual is unmatched by any other. We operate on the belief that society does not require a government to manage all of the affairs of its citizens. Two minute that when, left be, that le when left to be free, truly free, people are incentivized to do the right thing well more than they are not. Our party is not just a body with a political mission. We are a body of people who believe our shared ideas about the individual are fundamentally and morally superior than any alternative. Therefore, when considering observations about the good that comes when people engage with those who hate them, when considering the wealth of research that supports the simple idea that contact reduces prejudice, and considering that our vision of a free world intimidates many of our non-libertarian friends and family, I argue that we have the responsibility to lead the way in showing exactly how that world might look. Now, finally, I do want to quickly address how members can feel safe when peers have relationships with bigots, however it's defined. And the answer there is establishing boundaries. When you come to my home, for example, you may enter with the foulest of ideas. What you may not do is insult, threaten, intimidate, or speak foul to any person in my home. Those who do are shown the door. And if and when you have come to your senses and demonstrate that you are able to interact cordially and productively, the door will once again be open. The Libertarian Party is not best served by members disassociating based on obstinate beliefs. 30 seconds. Actual behavior. The Libertarian Party and the world around us is best served when we lead and demonstrate to the world that when used wisely, freedom of association and respect for the individual are powerful enough to change people and lead us to a world set free. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. That was D.L. Cummings from Liberty Dad Podcast. You can find that on the Free Speech Media Network. Uh, he's also the chair of the Libertarian Party of Duval County, telling us why the Libertarian Party is not best served by members disassociating from bigots. Uh, now, of course, we're going to go to Archie Flower uh, from the Libertarian Party of Vermont. He's the chair, and he's going to tell us why the Libertarian Party is best served by members disassociating from bigots. But I want to stop for a second. Thank you all for watching. I see you guys on Trovo. I see you on DLive, our multiple Facebook streams. Thank you so much. All of your comments and questions will be asked during this broadcast because an echo chamber that the Super Chats are as free as speech should be. If you want to support the show, help break the echo chamber. There's a share button. Share this stream and get this onto your timeline so we can help break echo chambers everywhere and expose people of all different persuasions to different types of thought. So ask your questions. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone is commenting. If you have a question or even just a statement, I am looking at all of these streams. I'm typing everything down into a separate sheet, and it will be asked during the broadcast. So, Archie, um, for real this time, 9.52, you have 10 minutes. So until 10.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roger. Today marks the 18th anniversary of the ground invasion of Iraq. That means that children now born can actually enlist in the war. And that's why I have a background with Iraq body count of uh, approximately 200,000 civilians. I would like to take a moment of silence. I would ask that everyone listening right now take that moment of silence with me in commemoration of these civilian casualties of American empire. Thank you. We are a party, as DL already said, and the 
explicit purpose of our party is given in our statement of principles, we are challenging the cult of the omnipotent state. And that's not a minor task. That's actually a pretty darn big thing. American empire isn't going to end itself. The military industrial complex isn't going to dismantle itself. The war on drugs isn't going to end itself. All of the atrocious foreign and domestic policies that our taxes stolen from us fund you know, bombs in Yemen, children being burned to death in our name by our money and our labor. This is not going to end itself. It's going to take a political party to do that. It's going to take a political party to get people elected to do that. And the only party that is in that game is the Libertarian Party. Certainly the Democrats have seeded the end of war ground. They no longer truly care, but you, you look at their actions, not their words. The GOP is just as bad. Look at the uh, level of groaning, keep going on under whichever the president. War ground. They should all be charged with war crimes and we all know this. So are we going to actually form a party that is effective? Or are we going to just stay a social club and debate ideas? If we want to be effective, we have to talk to real voters. And real voters aren't going to listen to us if we platform bigots. And let's be clear about what we mean when we say platform bigots. Bigotry is a spectrum, yes. And we can talk about definitions all day. But what we're really talking about in context of this greater libertarian moment is not the people at the one or two on the scale. We're talking about the people that dial it up to 11. We're talking about people like Nick Fuentes, Benjamin Owen, Richard Spencer, Christopher Cantwell, Hotep Jesus. We're not talking about people that are going to be your average neighbor. We're talking about leaders in their respective alt-right movement areas. You're talking about very vile ideas being platformed in libertarian spaces by very vile people. We can't end the war on drugs if we don't get people into office. We can't put someone in the position of commander in chief if we can't get people into office. We have to build that groundswell. We have to take local state houses. We have to build small. We have to get people into Congress, and then we can hope one day, as Larry Sharp has planned it out, to actually take the presidency in 2028, maybe, 2032, maybe, hopefully sooner rather than later. And that is why I'm here tonight, because if we're going to hope to convince voters to put us into office, we can't. We, we can't talk about platforming people like Hotep Jesus. It's, it's just not going to fly. We cannot lead a moral revolution that this country needs if we're going to be allowing people with blatantly dehumanizing beliefs to be our keynote speakers or to be lead activists or to have positions in our affiliates. Or, or even at the national level, voters may not be able to, libertarians love philosophy. We love to debate. We love to talk about every little nook and cranny of every piece of philosophy there is. Voters don't do that, and voters can't necessarily put into words why they won't vote for us, but they sense the hypocrisy of the duopoly. That's why vote totals have gone down. They know they're being gone. We can't break through that con if we're going to platform people that dehumanize others. The Libertarian Party is truly the party of we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal with inalienable right. If we don't live up to that, the voters will know. And if we don't get votes, we can't make the changes that are necessary. We can't withdraw our troops from the 
thousands of bases that we have overseas. We can't end the military industrial complex, which currently has uh, approximately an $800 billion uh, feast to uh, gorge itself on. We can't end the war on drugs, which took Breonna Taylor's life, which took George Floyd's life, which, which milita militarizes our police forces such that they are the standing army that the founders were worried about. They warned us about this. We have failed to heed that warning, and now American empire foreign policy has certainly come home to roost in its domestic policy, which is inevitable. If we want to save ourselves, if we want to save everyone whose boots you know, our, our, uh, everyone whose necks are, are under our boots via our stolen tax money, we have to get our act together. And we can't do that if we're going to platform people who dial bigotry up to 11 and who dehumanize people based on the color of their skin or any other ridiculous and absurd, vile metric. Thank you. Thank you very much, Archie. So that was Archie Flower of the Libertarian Party of Vermont telling us why the Libertarian Party is best served by members disassociating for bigots. Thank you all for your comments. I am recording them and for your questions because remember on Echo Chamber that Super Chats are as free as speed should be. So make sure to continue to help break the Echo Chamber of your, of your uh, timeline. Give us a share whether you're watching us on the FSM network or our Echo Chamber pages. So, guys, now we've heard from each of our guests, D.L. Cummings and Archie Flower. Now each participant is going to be able to respond uh, to each other for up to 10 minutes. So at this point, it is 10.01 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. D.L., you're going to have until 10.11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to tell us why the Libertarian Party is not best served by its members disassociating for bigots and to respond to what Archie had to say. So, D.L., the time is yours. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I think I'd like to point out first that America is roughly over somewhere over 320 million Americans. I don't know the exact number, but I know that it's definitely more than that. From what I've last seen, the Libertarian Party nationally comprises of roughly 650,000 members of those that we are able to identify. I know that there are some differences in reporting in various states. And there may be libertarians or there are plenty of libertarians who may be not or, or who, may, who may not be registered. So therefore, the number is most likely higher. But we'll just go with 650,000 for the time being. So the first thing that I would like to point out is that when other people are looking at us, or at least in my experience, and I, will, I welcome other people's experience talking to people outside of the Libertarian Party, I welcome data that says, hey, this is exactly what they're thinking. But my personal experience with tons of people in various cities, in various states, most of my friends who are not libertarians, is when they look at the Libertarian Party, what they see is disarray. I do not hear them talking about, hey, you guys are platforming this person that I've never heard of. And some of the names that he has mentioned, that you mentioned, Archie, I have never heard of or only recently have heard of. And maybe I'm not the best gauge because uh, I tend to have not heard of a lot of people for what, whatever that's worth. But what, I'm, what I want to get at is that when people talk to me, they say, hey, you guys seem to have uh, a problem getting your own house in order. And I was sitting here writing down some notes, you know, and, and it dawned on me, our party is already amazingly diverse. It's, a, it's way more diverse than I've ever heard anybody say that of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. However, because of that diversity, and I, and I don't think it's the diversity itself, but with the diversity, there's always possibility that there can be contention. And we certainly have a lot of contention. So when we look and we, we start talking to our peers about joining the party and we start trying to tell them about who we are as a party, it makes sense to ensure that our own house is in order of 650 plus thousand libertarians before we go and tell them, you should join our party 
and support the causes that we believe in, things like anti-war and other extremely important issues. But before we can tell them, they need to see that we can manage our own house before somebody is going to be willing to hear us talk about how we're going to manage the entire house of America, of over 320 million people, which is equally just as diverse as the Libertarian Party. Secondly, again, as I pointed out, what I'm talking about is not platforming or not platforming people. The question was, should we disassociate, should members disassociate from bigots? Is that in the best interest of the party? And I say, no, it's not. It's not based on observation, based on people like Dia, uh, Dia um, Khan, uh, Daryl Davis, myself, and other stories that you can find readily that we cherish and we enjoy because of the things that they were able to accomplish. And it doesn't when it comes to the data. When, the, when we go back and we look at the research, we find out that what happens is when people are together and when they are learning about each other, they resolve their differences on their own. And so when we learn to resolve the differences on our own, then we can go and start talking to people and telling them, hey, you need to join our party because we are the most moral party based on the national positions, things like anti-war and other things. These are the things that we need to do in order to put ourselves in a position to convince people that yes, we are the party that they want to join because we are the party that one, when they join, they're not gonna have to worry about are they being included as, uh, as a bigot by virtue of going to a particular, or joining a particular group or going to hear somebody speak or saying, hey, you know what, maybe this idea over here is, you know, I, I think there's some merit to this idea. And all these things, it's not just the, the platforming of some notor, uh, notable individual that, that gets the word bigot tossed around. The word bigot is tossed around for all manner of things. When I bring up the definition, it's because in practice, we use it so loosely, it might as well not mean anything. So we can say, oh, well, I'm talking about bigot. When I talk about it, I mean this. I'm talking about what does the group as a whole mean? Not only in the words that they say when they go and define it and they say, this is what I think a bigot is, but in the actions when they interact with each other. Those are the things that we need to shore up because if we can't shore up, uh, if we can't shore up our own house, there's no way that we can convince other people that we're prepared to, to work with a bigger house. That's what I got. Thank you very much, DL. So those are the, that's the response from DL. Thank you so much for everyone who is liking and commenting giving us your questions questions and statements. They will be brought up on the broadcast. Why? Because in Echo Chamber, the Super Chats are as free as speech should be. So make sure to get your questions in. At this point, it is 10.07 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Archie has up to 10 minutes, so up until 10.17 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for his rebuttal. And Archie, the time is yours. Go ahead. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, DL, for your thoughts. Um... This isn't going to be a direct quote. I typed what I could uh, type from what you just said. If we can't shore up our own house, then we can't manage a bigger house. Uh, exactly, exactly right. I, I agree with that. Um, but again, we're contextually not talking about someone just with a strong opinion. The, the greater argument within the Libertarian Party right now is talking about whether or not we should associate with people that are white nationalists and open about it, or any other kind of bigotry that dehumanizes people. Sure, um, yes, we, we should have the goal of educating people. I love the story of Daryl Davis and similar activists, but we have to remember that that's not something everyone can do. Um, we also have to remember that before that happens, they shouldn't be platformed as a, a guest speaker at our events, especially not one where it's 
advertise as they are a libertarian. If, if we muddy the waters about who is and who is not libertarian, we're not going to get the voters we need, again, to end war, end the war on drugs, end the Fed. All of these things, all of these goals are what we're in this party for. And if we can't get the votes, we can't make the changes. And if we can't convince voters because we're platforming people that make them uncomfortable because uh, white nationalism is not mainstream. Despite the woke left screaming about white supremacy being as big as they think it is, most Americans, I believe, reject racism. And they will reject us if we platform racists. They will reject us. They will never vote for us. If we start gaining traction, I guarantee that the media will bring up these people that are being platformed in our party. The media will absolutely rip us to shreds for this. Right now, it's not a big deal in the sense that there's no spotlight shown on the problem. But if we start getting state houses, if we start gaining traction, if we start actually dismantling or challenging the cult of the omnipotent state, I guarantee you it will fight back. And the media wing of the cult of the omnipotent state never pick a fight with someone that buys ink by the gallon. Well, look at all of the people that they have ready to totally trash our whole party and movement and all of our work. They don't have just one wing of the media. They own the media. The state right now is so infused into all of these corporations that they may as well be the same thing. If we're going to challenge that, we can't have hypocrisy within our, our moral code. Our moral code is based on the equality and equal rights of every person on this planet. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal. It didn't mention borders. It didn't mention skin color. It didn't mention religion. In fact, the founders created the wall of separation of church and state expressly because they understood that that would be the best path to protect individual human rights. What we need to remember is that if we're going to be a political party, we have to act like a political party. We can't act like a debate club. We can't act like a social club. And we certainly can't act like we're going to give these people voices when these voices tear down other people and dehumanize them. That is completely anti-libertarian and it is completely antithetical to the idea of getting libertarians elected. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Archie. So now we've heard from uh, both of our guests, and it's my favorite part of the program. Now we're going to continue to break some echo chambers because each of our guests are going to be able to ask each other up to three questions. The other participant has a two-minute response. Thank you so much, everyone, who's giving us your comments, whether you're on there on Trovo, DLive, our multiple Facebook streams, and also our Bitwave streams. So, guys, uh, continue to ask your questions because the super, uh, Echo Chamber, these Super Chats are as free as speech should be. So, DL is now going to have up to three questions to ask Archie. Archie has up to two minutes to respond to each question, and then we're going to repeat that process. So, DL, your time starts now. What is your first question for Archie? Go ahead. What is more powerful than an organization that presents a unified body despite having people within it who carry some of the best ideas, the worst ideas, and all and everything in between. I'll repeat that question. What is more powerful than an organization that presents a unified body despite having people who hold ideas that are some of the best, some of the worst, and everything in between? That's an interesting question, certainly. Um, 
but we have to remember that this is not just any organization. This is a political party. And if you're going to say that these are simply ideas, when you say worst ideas, I'm going to have to push back on that. These aren't just ideas. If you give people like Nick Fuentes real power, we will see things just like in Nazi Germany. If you give white nationalists real power, we will see Nazi Germany again, or North Korea, or the USSR. If you give collectivists real power, they will abuse it. And, and that's what we're talking about, a political party trying to gain real power so that we can actually make good changes and promote individual liberty for everyone in this country. Go ahead, DL, for your second question. At the end of my introduction, I suggested that boundaries were the answer, the more appropriate answer to dealing with uh, the way that people may actually behave with some of these foul ideas. So I guess the question that I would have, and I was trying to scribble it down, so I'm going to have to kind of wing it at this point. But, um, you know, and, and just, just to clarify, I'm talking about, you know, the boundaries, the little, in, the little story where I said, hey, if you come to my house and you insult people, then uh, I'm going to excuse you. I'm going to tell you, you need to leave. And then if, um, if and when you're able to show that you can, uh, that you can be productive, then I will open the door back for you. And this is kind of like my way of saying, this is the kind of boundary that we need to set. So given that, uh, what kind of power can somebody actually have when we have well-defined boundaries on behavior? Go ahead, Archie. This isn't just a question of power. This is a question of perception. Again, we're a political party. If we're going to be perceived by voters as the better choice, we need to make sure that those voters realize we have a, a, a code of morals that doesn't abide by racism, that doesn't abide by homophobia, that does not want anything to do with theocracy or or stoning gays. Um, I bring that up because of Gary North. He's a, a Mises fellow, and he has specifically said some very homophobic things. And if, if he's going to be essentially given a voice by our party, then how is our party really upholding equal rights? So it's not just about power. And in fact, it's mostly about perception because politics is mostly about perception. And if we want real power, if we want the trust of the voters, we can't allow that perception to be dragged through the mud by associating with bigoted people like this. Now go ahead for your final question, DL. You mentioned a number of names. I'm not terribly familiar with all of them. The last name you did mention something more specific. He said, you know, he said some homophobic things. Homophobic is another term that means different things to different people. Uh, we've had instances where people have said something that a large number of people said, hey, that's, you know, that's not really that, really that bad. Some other people said, no, it's really, really terrible. There have been other instances where somebody said something homophobic and it was largely agreed, yes, it was homophobic. So the range is, is, is kind of all over. Um, given that, there are a lot of everyday Americans that have probably said something that would be construed as homophobic, racist, transphobic, sexist, whatever, any of them. If we're busy worrying about perception and saying you can't come to this party and be platformed because you said something that's homophobic, that we, de that we define as homophobic. How do we encourage regular everyday people to join the party who may feel that the moment that somebody digs up their tweet, the, so much, the moment that they say something that's out of line, all of a sudden, all that same anger that they watched what's going on now towards some of these names, 
why would they want to join the party if they think that they may be subject to that in the future? Thank you very much for that question. So, Archie, two minutes to respond. Go ahead. Average America, yes. Um, why would they want to join the party if they think they're going to get raked over the coals for something they've done a while back? Uh, sounds like um, we're talking about cancel culture. I think that what we need to realize is most people are actually good people. Most people, even if they say something inappropriate, we're talking about, you know, again, to use that, that, that idea of dialing it up to 11 with some of these white nationalists I'm talking about, we're talking about something with the average American that's going to be more like a, a two or a three or a four or a five. And within that range, they're, they're much more reachable. Our party should have education as a goal. Our party should have the idea that libertarianism needs to be spread both in terms of education and in terms of getting into office. I absolutely agree with that goal. I also absolutely believe that most Americans, when you present the ideas to them that we're presenting tonight, will realize that they should change their attitudes and that, yes, everyone does have equal rights and, yes, hate is bad. And to address the opposite side of that as to whether or not they should be worried about being called out for a, a three-year-old, five-year-old, whatever, tweet or any other instance where they may have done wrong, I do believe in the power of redemption and that that should also be part of our educational message. Thank you very much, Archie. So those are the last questions for DL. So now Archie is going to have the three questions to ask DL. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who are just joining the stream, uh, Echo Chamber has a policy that the Super Chats are as free as speech should be. So continue to make your statements, continue to get your questions in, because up next is my absolute favorite part of this program, where I take your questions and I ask them to our wonderful, amazing guests. But that's not coming up right now, so hold on. It's, it's coming. I know you're excited. Archie. You have up to three questions that you can ask DL. DL has up to two minutes to respond to each question. And Archie, at this moment, you can go ahead for your first question. Go ahead, Archie. I would simply ask what your limit is for someone such as our national chair. Um, should we elect a, a white nationalist to, our, to be our chair? Um, and if not, then what is your limit? Go ahead, DL, to two minutes. I'm going to assume that the limit was only with the chair of the party. So I will answer that. No, we should not elect a known white nationalist to the, to the, uh, to the chair of the party. And since I have a few more moments, I guess, we shouldn't elect them to any leadership position. Because... I think that when we really look at it, what we want to do is we want to elect leaders who understand the message the best. They understand the philosophy the best. They communicate it the best. And they are the best at helping the members improve their own selves. And that's what leadership is about. But that's not what I'm talking about. When I, when I make this argument about disassociation, I mean, I've already stated that we should have boundaries and they should be very clear boundaries. And we can have specific boundaries on leadership, including the chair. That's my question. That's my answer. All right, Archie. And whenever you're ready, you can ask your second question. Go ahead, Archie. Okay. We just used the example of white nationalism. Um, what other disqualifying bigotries would you include in that list? Go ahead, DL, whenever you're ready.
If you are bigoted against a large portion of the membership in the, in the body that you want to serve, that's a disqualifier. All right, and now, uh, Archie, your last question. Go ahead. I would like you to expound on that. Um, like, not just, uh, I mean, so white nationalism is obviously racism. Um, I, I would assume that you're against any form of racism. But um, what about uh, an anti-Semite or someone bigoted towards any other religion? Um, that type of thing. What, 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 uh, are there any hatreds you would think that dehumanize people that would be appropriate for our leadership? That's, right, yeah. that's going to be a little hard to answer because you mentioned the word hatred. And as I defined bigotry earlier, bigot earlier, hatred was not in any of the three definitions that I provided. So it's going to be a little bit difficult to answer that particular question. As for expounding on my previous question, anybody that wants to be in leadership that has bigoted attitudes and they express them toward the members, any member. It doesn't matter whether it's a sexual orientation. It doesn't matter whether it's their gender. It doesn't matter whether it's a group within the group. Any bigotry toward another group of people should be a disqualifier for leadership. Well, thank, thank you much. So that is the, the question and answer portion of the, of the program. And now we're going to get to your your questions and oh guess what we didn't charge you why because on echo chamber the super chats are as free as speech should be so if you had questions or if, even if you had statements that you wanted me to read to our panelists now is the time to do so and we are on trovo we're getting them in on d live we're getting them in on our facebook streams our bitwave stream also i'm getting a few this way and feel free to dm them to me personally if you're on my friends list and you don't really want the question you know being traced back to you we do respect your anonymity so you can just go ahead and DM me the question. So uh, another thing that I always say on this show, I don't write these questions. I just give them. I am just the messenger at this point. So at this point, I can't really uh, create necessarily even conditions. So if everybody wants to ask DL questions, that's what that's what happens. If everyone wants to ask Arsky questions, that's simply what happens. But um, I'm going to do my best to try to keep as even as possible. So without further ado, uh, a two-minute response uh, limit um, in terms of time as well because we have a lot of questions. So this one is for you, Archie. So Archie, do you believe that bigotry is simply an opinion? If no, why not? Why is bigotry not simply an opinion? If yes, why should the LP disavow people simply for their opinions? Go ahead, Archie. We cannot hear you. Go ahead. That would be because I had my mute on. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Bigotry, as we're discussing it in the greater context of the Libertarian Party, where we're talking about Christopher Cantwell, Richard Spencer, those sorts. We're not talking about just ideas. We're talking about historical actions where these ideas invariably lead to atrocities when people with these ideas get into power. Should we police thoughts? No, the government absolutely shouldn't police thoughts. Should we, as a party, police our membership and their thoughts? The problem with that is, yeah, it's just an idea from the point of view of if they haven't taken any action, it's just an idea. But again, politics, and, and, and we're a political party, we can't forget that politics is about perception. If we're going to allow these people into our spaces, it sends a message. It, it alters the perception. And if we want to actually succeed at getting votes and getting into office and repealing these disgusting, abhorrent laws, we need to keep that perception in mind at all times. Thank you very much, Archie. Now, this question is for you, uh, DL. DL, 
What does the LP have to gain specifically by platforming racists? Go ahead, DL. I'm not arguing that they should platform racists. I'm not sure how to answer that. I just, the, the, the statement that I was um, arguing in the negative was, should, uh, is the LP best served by its members disassociating from bigots? It doesn't say anything about platforming. I'm not arguing that they should be platformed. Okay. Hey, very, very good. Okay. So now we're going to go back to, to you, Archie, here. Um, Archie, this question was also privately DM'd. Um, if white nationalists want to buy land and leave you alone, why does that bother you, and how does that violate the Libertarian Party statement of principles? Go ahead, uh, Archie. If white nationalists bought— Do you want me to, uh, repeat, you want me to repeat the question? Please. Sure, okay. Uh, so this, again, was uh, personal DM, and I'll, I'll repeat the question for clarification. If white nationalists want to buy land— and then leave you alone, assuming that my 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 understanding of the question is they're talking about buying property and, and going and living on it. So if white nationalists want to buy land and leave you alone, why does that bother you? And how does that violate the Libertarian Party's statement of principles? So we, we are talking about creating... Um, some kind of space for white nationalists to live and not bother anyone else. And from that point of view, that's well within the purview of their rights. I'm not sure it per se violates our statement of principles. Um, white nationalism certainly isn't compatible with libertarianism, but some group going off and doing their own thing and not being violent I don't have a problem with that per se. Um, I certainly have a problem with their philosophy. I certainly have a problem with their hatred. But I'm not saying they can't just buy some space and go off and live on their own. That's never been my contention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, DL, this question comes from a good friend of the program, uh, Musege Kien Jojo. And he's from Uganda, and he asked a question. Uh, I'll get a response from both of you. Uh, he says, we are building a young libertarian party in Uganda. What advice do you give to avoid such troubles in the future? So, like, I, I don't know specifically what he's referring to, but potentially maybe maybe this question, questions of race um, and that coming into the, the libertarian party, racial divisions. What advice would you give the young libertarian movement? Boundaries. It's always boundaries. Like I said earlier in my introduction, I said, if, you know, I used the example of somebody coming to my home. I said, look, you can come in with any ideas that you want. You're more than welcome. And I have invited many people that have ideas that I absolutely detest into my personal home. And I've talked to them. And the standing rule that I have is that you do not insult anybody in my home. You do not intimidate them. You do not mock them. You do not do anything toward that person. It doesn't mean that you can't have a, a terrible idea, right? Like lots of people, everybody has a terrible idea to somebody. So we cannot use the, the, the idea that somebody has a terrible idea as a barometer. So the, the idea, was, the idea, what we want to do is we want to create a clear set of boundaries. And these boundaries are based on actions. If you come into our space, our libertarian space, and you say, look, you know, I don't think I'm libertarian or, hey, I think I'm really, really libertarian. And uh, then we start listening to some of your ideas and we say, well, those ideas really aren't libertarian. If you're just expressing them and you're not using them to intimidate people, that should be fine. But the moment, the moment you start intimidating somebody, the moment you start aggressively speaking, acting towards somebody, then we need to call that boundary up and say, look, you've crossed the boundary and whatever, whatever the, however they have crossed it, we should have a remedy for it. And that may include saying, look, until you can get your act together, you are not welcome here. Boundaries. And that question was an open question. So, Archie, if you want to take a few moments, if, if you have any thoughts, um, again, to repeat, uh, this is an, a Ugandan libertarian activist, wants to know how his Ugandan uh, movement can avoid these types of problems in the future. Any thoughts from you, Archie? Um, 
Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you uh, for for trying to bring libertarianism to your part of the world. Uh, it's it's the most beautiful possible message we could bring to our neighbors. It really is. It's one of uh, one of the best things that you could do is to spread this message. So thank you very much. Um, I would say first of all, persevere. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to it's going to be absurd. Um, one of the things libertarians love to say is that good ideas don't require force. Well, I add to that that good ideas do require repetition. So, you know, take advantage of the internet, learn all you can about marketing, and get out there and thank you for persevering. Yes, and as always, I want to put on, he is our Ugandan friend doing a great thing to bring liberty, liberty to the people of Uganda and uh, a real thorn in uh, in uh, Museveni's side. So uh, thank you so much for watching, Musege, and uh, thanks for supporting the program. All right, so now we're going to go to a question for DL. And I have to pull this back up. And if you guys, if you want to see better production value, you can always go to patreon.com forward slash echo chamber podcast. So I don't have to do all of this myself. So DL, all violent actions begin as opinions. Shouldn't the LP disavow those who espouse ideologies which necessarily and unavoidably lead to violent outcomes? Go ahead, DL. No. The reason why is because any idea, even a good idea, can turn into a violent one. We could simply say, hey, you know what? Um, some of our ideas, we could use force to make sure that they don't happen. We could say, hey, we're going to go and start our own militia. And every time we see police officers doing something that we believe violates the non-aggression principle, we're going to attack them. We're going to attack our military. We're going to attack anybody that's... It, it could always lead to violence. Any idea. Those aren't really the best examples off the cuff. But any idea can lead to violence. So absolutely not, because it assumes that the assumption, I think, is that only the bad ideas are going to lead to violence. But good ideas can equally lead to violence as well. Thank you very much for that. Now, uh, we're going to go back to you, Archie. Archie, you're going to receive a statement and then um, a question. This statement comes from Dennis Pratt, who, thank you very much, Dennis, for watching this program. He, of course, is the organizer of the Pork Fest Festival that Echo Chamber and FSM will be at, amongst uh, other other great activities. And Dennis Pratt says, Archie, I think I may have to, to debate you on this at PF if they can't find anyone else. I think you are misunderstanding and undermining the core of libertarianism. We'll have to see if they can find a worthy opponent, but it would be an entertaining debate. That would be wonderful. Um, so that's a, a statement from Dennis Pratt. But a question for you, Archie. How can you claim to value diversity and then propose silencing a distinct group of people? Isn't that a contradiction? Go ahead whenever you're ready, Archie. I do value diversity. Um I value diversity of thought and idea because that's what the, uh, the the contents of one's character come from is your heart, your mind, your soul. However, you want to, you know, view that metaphysically or spiritually. The I forget the guy's name. the The paradox of tolerance is is that we cannot tolerate the intolerant. The plain fact is that these people that want to bring hate into our movement are bringing in collectivist ideas. They're bringing in a form of collectivism. That's what racism is. That's what all bigotry is. It dehumanizes people. And if we're going to be the party of individualism, if we're going to be the party that truly does value diversity, we can't bring in people that will dehumanize others based on such things. Now, like I mentioned before, oh, I'm sorry, Archie, did you have something else to say? Oh, okay, I, I, must, no. I must have misheard, I apologize. So like I mentioned before, Archie, um, I, I don't want to just pick on you, but the rest of the questions are just for you. And DL, I don't want you to just kind of twiddle your thumbs there. So I, I, what I'm going to do now, um, unless we get some questions for DL, I'm going to ask the questions to Archie, and DL, I'm going to give you up to 30 seconds to respond. Um, 
So this is the first question for you, Archie. Uh, Archie, can former members of the alt-right redeem themselves and rejoin the LP? And if so, how? That's a really good question, and thank you for asking it. I do believe in the power of redemption. I do believe that people can change. I do believe that change is one of the most fundamental aspects of humanity, that we can adapt, we can overcome, we can learn. In fact, that is in the, the root of what humans are, is that we can change our ideas with new information, with new experiences. How is that proven that that's been done with uh, someone that's dialed bigotry up to 11, as I keep pointing out? You need to be able to express a sincere apology. And just like with obscenity, you know it when you see it. You, you can tell a fake apology, you can tell a sincere apology and if someone truly has sincerely changed, then Barnwell should be able to welcome them into the LP. Yes. DL, up to three seconds to respond. Go ahead. So I would say that the, the example of Ken Parker that I gave earlier is a really good example of somebody showing redemption. Now, he was not formerly a libertarian member of a party, of a, a member of the Libertarian Party. But if somebody breaks the trust, they have to go out of their way in order to show that they are worthy of being trusted again, even if it's only a small amount of trust. And what he did by uh, reaching out to a, a black pastor and starting to attend their church and being baptized and having his tattoos removed, that is a pretty significant move that I would think, had he been a libertarian, he would be showing that he has truly changed. Thank you very much for that. So this question is for you, Archie, and again, Arch, um, DL. Uh, we'll give you up to 30 seconds to respond afterwards. So, Archie, uh, this is this comes from Bitwave. We already aren't getting the votes we need. Why not just allow those who abide by the SOP, which I infer the statement of principles, to do what they are asked to do at events or by their parties? Libertarians aren't mainstream. Most Americans are against many things we advocate for. Uh, any response, Archie? Go ahead. We have a moment in time right now. I would say it began in 2016 when it became, you know, ridiculously obvious. You had Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. You can't get, I don't want to say you can't get more absurd than that because the duopoly is going to keep proving us wrong on that point. Those two choices are so phenomenally absurd that it's, it's breaking the spell that the duopoly already has over the American people. If you look at, the map of the United States from 2016 as to if none of the above was on the ballot, it would have swept the electoral college. Right now, there's a phenomenal amount of people that are so sick of the duopoly that they just don't vote. If we want to reach those people, we need to get our act together. And we need to remember that Politics is largely perception. And if we keep, you know, associating and platforming bigots, that's what we're going to be known for, and we're never going to get out of the trenches. All right, up to three seconds to respond. DL, go ahead. So I think the answer is that 500 plus studies and a meta analysis that show that when people interact together, that prejudice goes down tells us that yes, if somebody is willing to obey the SOP or what I've been calling uh, respecting the boundaries, if you will, uh, then yes, they should absolutely be permitted in the party, regardless of who they, uh, who they are or what name is attached to them. Because that is what the data says is good for the group as a whole. All right. Thank you very much, DL. So here's another question. Um, let's pull this back up here. All right. So Archie, Let's bring your face back on the screen for all the viewers. All right, so, Archie, is it a violation of the non-aggression principle to want to see your ethnic and or people group survive and be healthy and to make non-violent action to see that end happen? Um, that was it, Whoever wrote this wrote it kind of choppy, so I'm going to read it again. Is it a violation of the non-aggression principle 
to want to see your ethnic and or people group survive and be healthy and to make nonviolent action to see that end happen. Go ahead. That, uh, that definitely sounds like a, an allusion to my debate with Dave Smith. And in that, I, I certainly did not present my ideas the way they should have been. The non-aggression principle to me states it is immoral to initiate force or fraud against a non-consenting person. And if you change any of those pieces, you get a different concept. When you dehumanize someone, you don't, consent doesn't even come into the equation anymore. So from that point of view, you are violating the NAP on a philosophical level. You are not actually violating it in the traditional sense that libertarians have come to understand as a violation of the NAP. With no force or fraud involved, it's not a NAP violation per the standard understanding. What I'm saying is we should extend our understanding of the NAP to realize that it's more than just words, it's an actual concept, it will lead to tangible justice in people's lives if we adhere to it. Thank you. Thank you. And DL, up to 30 seconds to respond. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm not terribly familiar with anything that transpired in a previous debate with Archie and Dave Smith. I did watch part of it, but I don't recall it. So I cannot answer on anything related to that matter. So I'll answer the question directly. No, it is not a violation of the NAP to want to see people of your ethnic group, uh, I, I think it was survive without any level of uh, violence being right. extended That's towards the gist, yeah. else. And, and And I would further say that any... Um, any further assumption of what a NAP violation is needs to come with uh, needs to come with evidence before we're willing to accept any further uh, philosophical view, as Archie has mentioned. Okay. Now, this question, I'll, I'll actually keep with you, DL. Uh, this comes from our other our friend in Uganda as well. Thank you very much, Masegi. Of two, Trump and Joe, who is their choice? Why? Uh, why in our, uh, why in each of these two troubles to the world? So I think he's asking um, if you had to choose between Trump or Joe Biden, who would you choose, and why? Why? Why are these two people bringing so much, pro so many problems to the world? Uh, go ahead, DL. Trump or Trump or Joe Biden? The ultimate question. Trump right? Or, right, right. Trump or Joe Biden? Um, <laughs> wow, that's a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> You know, because you have to vote for one of them, right? Because if, if you vote right. for if you right. one of them, then the other will win and it'll be worse. Why waste your vote in a third right. party, right? So I'm going to go with this. You know, we've been, uh, you, you know, Archie has mentioned the mainstream media a while, uh, uh, multiple times. The mainstream media is very, very good at keeping, at being a watchdog for Republicans. And they were a very good watchdog for Donald Trump. They alerted us to everything and anything about Donald Trump. And now that we have Joe Biden, it seems to have toned down quite a bit. So, and, and I've seen this in the past. So I'm going to go with Donald Trump simply because the, uh, the, the, the mainstream media is actually going to be there to help alert us to what's going on. All right. So it's confirmed. D.L. Cummings, Trump fan and supporter. Um, anyway, go that. Okay, go on. I'm about a fan and supporter. <laughs> All right, Archie, you have the pleasure of choosing between Donald Trump or Joseph Biden. Uh, we pick your poison here. Go ahead. Um, I'm I'm going to stick with the most libertarian tradition uh, of all and vote for none of the above. Oh, boo. Okay. Well, hey, that's fine. Not a big problem. All right. Uh, last statement here. This also comes from our friend from Africa. So Africa has a history of migration across the continent. The current boundaries were formalities. Likewise, America was originally known for Red Indians. Migration made it possible for the current diversity. How come the present doesn't recognize this liberty that they have in Africa to move freely? Uh, go ahead, DL, and then you, Archie. Okay, so just to make sure I understand the question, how come currently in Africa it is not recognized to have the freedom of movement? Is that, is that yeah, the question? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I guess the gist of the question is that in Africa the – the borders were basically created by the Europeans, so the, the natives may not really recognize them as, as much. 
So how come he's asking in America we have we have we are so strict on borders and immigration policy when he's alleging that in Africa they they don't have very strong borders so to speak in, in that sense and there's a, a free movement of people and they kind of get along fine in his opinion why does America have a more strict stance on border security or or you know allowing who can or can't come in the country. You know, honestly, that's going to be a question that I'm going to be able to, I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer very strongly as far as why do we have such a strong view of, uh, of, of borders. I'm going to go ahead and make an assumption, though, that like most people of the world, that when you have a group of people, it tends to be us and them. And so we can kind of see that when you break down the states, at least today, I can't tell you about, you know, necessarily the history. But when you look at it today, we still have kind of like us and them. It's Florida and Georgia. It's this state versus that state. It's this country versus that country. I mean, we even have it when it comes to like Canada, like like what beef do we have with Canada? But it's still, okay, it's those Canadians. So I think part of it has to do with the fact that groups kind of collectively get together and they, they identify as a people. All right, Archie, anything you want to add to that? Could you, could you please repeat the question? Uh, yes, of course. Let me pull it up. So Africa has a history of migration across the continent. The current boundaries were formalities. Likewise, America was originally known for Red Indians. Migration made it possible for the current diversity. How come the present doesn't recognize this liberty to move freely? How come America doesn't recognize uh, the right to move freely, as was he alleged is observed currently in Africa and by uh, the Native Americans? Um, so I'm just going to preface this by saying that history isn't my strongest, uh, subject. I will, however, say that as America has created base after base and, and created an empire overseas, it has given our elites, our politicians, the, the, the taste of the fruit of, of control, and they love it. And that's why they have created more and more controls, and that's why they try to appeal to that part of the voter base, because it ultimately provides um, them with more control over the populace. Well, that concludes... Echo Chamber, Season 2, Episode 11. We all, I want to thank both of our guests, Archie Flower of the Libertarian Party of Vermont, the chair, and also D.L. Cummings of the Libertarian Party of Duval County. He's the chair there, and also the host of Liberty Dad Podcast that you should watch uh, by finding him on Facebook. You can go find Liberty Dad there. He's also on the Free Speech Media Network. Thank you both for uh, joining. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Archie and D.L.